Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, next event in the uh, Unsung Stories uh, Symposium this weekend. Uh, this is going to be the roundtable on new histories and futures for the CMC and beyond. And we've got some really stellar panelists. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is Brad Garten. I'm the uh, current director of the Computer Music Center, a position I've had since 1996. In 1995, Fred Larendahl and I were co-directors. That's when I was going through my tenure review. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of nervous because, you know, this is kind of a big event. A lot of really great things have been happening. And um, like I said, we have some really wonderful people here. Uh, now, I just want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, uh, earlier this morning, uh, they acknowledged the Lenape people in Manhattan. I'm actually out on Whidbey Island on the West Coast, um, just northwest of Seattle. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge the ancestral homelands of the coastal Salish peoples here. Uh, in particular, the Skagit, Snohomish, and Suquamish, and the sacred spiritual connection with the land and the water that they have. And of course, the labor of the slaves who were brought over here to make America great. Um, and I'd like to do some thank yous, because this is my chance to do that. I'd like to thank especially Ellie Hisama and Zasha de Castri for putting this on and organizing and doing a Herculean amount of work. Obviously, I want to thank the panelists and all the sessions, and especially this one, because uh, they're going to be carrying the burden of the stuff. And I want to thank all the people that I've seen that have been involved in the CP, uh, EMC and the CMC through the years, because it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty amazing history. And it's just been kind of stunning to realize what, what's been done here. And one special shout out to Seth Cluett, um, who uh, is a lecturer in discipline in the music department now and uh, the uh, assistant director at the uh, CMC. And Seth just does an amazing job of keeping things going, especially during the, the recent pandemic. Okay. Uh, I just want to mention that if you've got uh, questions and answers, uh, use that Q&A chat feature down below in your Zoom webinar screen, and uh, we'll be getting to them, I hope, in a bit. All right. Now, I'm going to introduce the panel quickly and briefly, but uh, I just want to say that, you know, it's been kind of gratifying because things have changed. It is possible to do change. Um, and in particular, I'll just relate a story it was a year ago last fall that I walked into my um, advanced computer music seminar, and there were maybe about, uh, I think, 10 or 12 people there. And I realized that I was the only white male in the room. And that's a sea change. You know, um, the other thing I want to mention is this is thanks to George Lewis, my, uh, my colleague, um, Georg Haas, and Sasha de Castri, especially, that we've now achieved gender parity in the composition program in the music department, um, which took some work. But uh, yeah, it was good work. And I just mentioned the sound art applicants that we've had this year. I think we're about 50-50, female and male, and a huge uptick in people of color applying. Um, it's interesting, naming something sound art rather than music composition tends to break down barriers. Surprising. So a lot of the credit for this goes to the participants in this seminar and this symposium. And for example, our panel. And I'm going to introduce them quickly. I'm not going to go through the awards and such you can read i mean these people are just amazing um you can read about them on the uh, on the website but i just want to highlight a few things and maybe mention a few things that aren't in the awards uh, first of all we have mara helmuth uh, she's currently teaching at the um cincinnati conservatory of music at the university of cincinnati and she composes music that involves a computer of course um and creates multimedia and software for composition and improvisation in fact mara was one of the first um people involved in the Internet 2 project, and we did improvisations between Columbia and Cincinnati that were just great fun, sometimes frustrating, but great fun. She's a past president of the International Computer Music uh, uh, Conference uh, uh, Association, excuse me, and was very involved in getting China uh, involved in the thing, uh, resulting in an ICMC, a conference being held in Beijing. And she's the first graduate student that I ever met at Columbia. I was sitting in my office in 1987. Mara walked in and said, I want to take your class, OK? And she was also the second teaching assistant for the computer music class I've had. And one final story, her dissertation piece was called Melips, which was a huge sound piece using, actually referred to an elliptical filter algorithm that she used to construct this. And she was required to have a score, but it was all sound. So what Mara did was a huge Fourier transform showing the spectrum of the entire piece and submitted that as her score. Apparently it worked. She's now, um, you know, Professor Mara Helmuth. 
Second panelist uh, is Mia Masaoka, and uh, I'll just read this because this is pretty amazing. She works at the intersection of sound and resonance, composition, spatialized perception, and social interaction, and that's all true. Her work encompasses notated compositions, objects infused with sound, instrument building, computing wearables, and sonification of the behavior of plants, brain activity, and insect movement. Um, and in fact, it's that resume that uh, that made her the director of our new sound art program at Columbia, the MFA program. Um, she's also an accomplished Koto player. And uh, I remember I had the privilege of, of improvising with her at a, a Koto festival that Barbara Roosh had organized to the uh, Institute for Japanese Studies. And she's, me is just amazing. I've been a huge fan of hers for years. In fact, I was pretty scared when I first met her because she was really famous. And, uh, but she's just such a sweet and wonderful person. Um, as director of our sound art program, we've seen a doubling of our applicants almost every year since she's been director. So she's doing something really well. She's had many, many awards and commissions, um, uh, including she's got coming up a 2021 MPAC commission, which was deferred because of the pandemic. But the big news for Mia is that she's a 2021 recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. Oh, so congratulations to her. All right. Uh, next person, Katharina Rosenberger, is now uh, at the University of Music in Lübeck, um, Germany. She was born in Zurich, and she was a professor of composition at the University of California, San Diego, for 12 years. And I don't know if Katharina knows this, but uh, the competition for her position was insane. There were, oh, I think, over 200 applicants. And the final five that uh, they were looking at, I believe, were all Columbia and CMC alumni. And Katarina was chosen to do it, had a great tenure there. Um, but now she's moved on back to Germany. And uh, she's also been a receiver of many fellowships and commissions. And in fact, we've got another Guggenheimer here, but hers was in 2019, 2020. So yeah, this is just a Guggenheim kind of panel. Um, she's also co-artistic director of a brand new festival called Sonic Matter um, back in Zurich. It's funny, she's not a CMC teaching assistant. A lot of them were like Mara. Um, I thought she was, and I asked her if she was, because she was at the center so often. So yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what she has to say. Sandra Woodruff, you've already uh, heard from. Uh, she's had 20 years in the music business, and she says she works as a recording artist, songwriter, composer, and guitarist. What you, don't, what you need to realize, and you'll hear this in her podcast, is that she worked with really famous people, like, uh, you know, Backstreet Boys and, you know, stuff that just makes me go, ah. She got her undergraduate degree from Columbia, and she did a lot of work, as you heard in the previous panel, panel um, with the Daughters of Harlem project. Um, and she's actually taken that lesson and applied it back in Pittsburgh, where she's from. The Limelight Studios that she kind of co-founded, um, and she's also producer of Engagement and Social Impact at this Kelly Strayhorn Theater, um, is working very hard to bring fellowships through their scale program to uh, women in music and women of color in particular. I also want to mention, uh, she had a strong interest in neuroscience, which is an area that I've kind of delved in. And I've done some work with a neuroscientist at the medical center named uh, Dave Solzer, Professor Solzer. And uh, we had these goofy headsets. And Sandra is one of the few people who actually took a strong interest and made it work. Um, she put on these EEG headsets and was able to like, you know, sonify brainwave activity. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable project, it's the kind of thing that I just love about the CMC. And then finally, we've got Nina Young um, from University of Southern California, Thornton School of Music. And I'll read what she says about her, her music is characterized by an acute sensitivity to tone color manifested in oral images of vibrant arresting immediacy and her voice misses elements of classical canon modernism, spectralism, American experimentalism, minimalism, electronic music, and popular idioms. Again, this is all true. And her projects, she, she's done a lot of concert works, interactive installations, and she tries to really create unique sonic environments um, when, she, when she's working. And I got to say, I'm a, I really like Nina's music. It's, it's just beautiful stuff. In fact, I, I, I like it all. You know, I always tell my students I have no tastes. And, you know, I'm not going to go there. I, I just, <laughs> I just fun stuff. <laughs> I was going to talk about issues of quality in music. And uh, uh, that's just too much of a hot word right now. Uh, Nina, like everybody on here, has won many, many awards and commissions. And she's another recipient of a 2021 Guggenheim Foundation. So yeah, it's, it's pretty astounding to see these things. All right. Um, Nina was also my TA uh, for years at Columbia. 
and uh, she she didn't do a lot of tech work at the center per se because she she wanted to focus on her writing. But as you know, became apparent to me as she was my TA, she's just like a technical powerhouse. I mean, she, her undergraduate degree is from MIT. Uh, she went to McGill and did a huge amount of you know music tech work there, and uh, yeah, she just she. I, I don't think she even differentiates between composition and music tech or anything. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, yeah, she's 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 the real McCoy. And I'll just mention she also is another founder of an ensemble. Uh, she's got this uh, sinfonietta called Ensemble Echappe, which has done remarkable work. And you know, I'm looking forward to hearing more from it. So anyhow, that's our illustrious panelists, and um, I'm not saying that facetiously. Um, I'm going to start out and ask them to uh, to take about five minutes, and you know, the question is, you know, tell me about your work, okay? With a particular emphasis, and this is, you know, um, because of the particular nature of this uh, symposium, with an emphasis on how the CMC and technology has impacted your work and your lives. And we'll say about five minutes each, and maybe I'll jump in if you're going berserk, because um, I want to make sure to stay on time here. But uh, let's start out with, let's go in reverse order. Let's start out with Nina, okay? So tell me about your stuff. Tell everybody. Well, hi, everybody. It's really nice to be on here. Um, and I think I'm, I'm the junior member of this panel. And I like I graduated most recently. So it's like a, a very big honor to be on here with um, all of these amazing women who I respect. And Brad, I respect you a lot, too. <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to jump off uh, starting with what you said about, um, yeah, when I came to Columbia, I had every intention of really doing, continuing um, mixed music. So uh, music with instrumentalists um, and live interaction. Uh, but then um, I, actually uh, one of the perhaps terrible things that happens in the first few sessions as a new graduate student is you present your work to uh, the other graduate students and they tear it apart a little bit. Um, and it became clear to me uh, when I presented my work that I was hiding behind my, uh, in my, I was hiding in my music with my facility uh, at the computer. Uh, and I wanted to be equally strong in instrumental writing as I was um, in synthesizing sounds and, and creating um, different systems uh, using the computer and, and other electronic elements. So I decided to go on this journey of um, creating an acoustic language that mimicked what I was doing in the studio to give myself freedom, um, uh, technical freedom to sort of choose what I was working with. But at the same time, I was uh, you know, working as a TA at the CMC for my entire time at Columbia. And I had absolutely amazing colleagues there. Uh, Zasha Dekestri is here on the panel, Sky McClay, Natasha Deals, they were on the previous panel, Brian Jacobs. Um, was also at the center, Taylor Brooke. I mean, it was just, it was a, a slew of incredible people. And I was watching what they were doing while um, also kind of creating a teaching practice, um, which was very inspired by Brad and the sort of DIY culture that you could do whatever you want. So you come up with a project and then you figure out the tools that you need. And if you don't know how to use those tools, you learn how to do them because everything is actually accessible. Um, so I took this ethos to heart uh, in acoustic music, but then as I was finishing up uh, my time at Columbia, I was like, okay, I kind of think I know what I'm doing with the acoustic music. Now it's time to reintegrate this interactive tech. And I was kind of lost because the way I was doing it before wasn't needed anymore. Um, and so I spent, I think, I guess about the last gosh, now it's six or seven years figuring out what this practice, this renewed kind of practice is for me. And for me, this comes from um, a series of collaborations and really thinking about performance environments um, and creating a sense of space and places of, of ritual where people can gather. Uh, and I, I think this really started with a collaboration that I was making with two other uh, artists, Anne Lanzalotti, um, Anne Leila Hula Lanzalotti, uh, as well as Sanem Perler. She's a transmedia artist uh, who was one of uh, the graduate students I was working with at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And we started a, a performance improv uh, collective called Sound Constructions, where we built improvisational installations in different environments. 
um, and then connected microphones, um, different kind of processing to these and improvised uh, these sculptures that we would create. And for me, this was a really big point of departure and freedom from the constraints of instrumental writing while also working with spatial audio in a way that I hadn't really done too much um, on, after leaving my master's program. Uh, and now I'm really excited because I think spatial audio is where I've been uh, digging into uh, headfirst. And I'm excited actually to spend some time at the CMC uh, this coming academic semester working uh, at the center. Um, Brad Garten has always been an inspiration with the work he's been doing with spatial audio and VR recently. Um, and so I think it's the ethos of the CMC and the fact that anything is possible. And that it, the, I suppose like my work has been inspired by the fact that I don't have to be reliant on fancy high tech to make my dreams come true. Uh, you know, I, I wanna think of my projects as possible in really fancy centers, but something you can make at a bar as well. Uh, and, and for me, that, that's been super important. So I'll leave it at that and we can continue the conversation from there. Great, thanks, Nina. Um, next, uh, let's uh, ask a question of Sandra. Uh, tell us about your tech background and, and again, sp specific stuff about the CMC, any dirt you wanna like spread out there. Dirt, let me see. Um, no, thank, first, thank you for having me here again. It's great to see you again, Brad, and, and meet everyone. Um, I, I entered, let's say I entered Columbia um, by way of the School of General Studies. So at this point I had already been um, in the music industry on a complete roller coaster uh, as a singer songwriter, 1999, going to tons of uh, labels and, and doing various things in a very traditional music industry, going to be a, a rock star per se, um, sort of artist, uh, thinking that I'm playing grunge, but really it's really the folkiest thing you could possibly um, imagine. So yes, having that experience with like the Backstreet Boys, Taylor Swift and Elo Couche and those types of folks, um, but still running into this sort of, of, of barrier of what I'm in control in with my music, but going into these very large studios and seeing all the magic happening, the Oz effect, but not really knowing what um, was going on, but learning by way of just, just watching and coming back around full circle 2016, being able to go to Columbia and encounter um, Brad as my, as my academic advisor at that point. And that was sort of an introduction to the CMC for me, because as we know, they're, they're separate. Um, uh, they're not very close to each other, the main campus. So um, my original work, guitar, I play guitar. That's what I do. Um, I have a little, you know, uh, I had the time I had a little uh, home studio. Um, but once going into the CMC and working with um, Professor David Schultz, hearing more about Brad's um, interest and in the CMC and working with the Daughters of Harlem, taking a class in just digital, digital music um, and opening up the space for me to actually understand what it means to take my acoustic sound to a digital sound, um, to understanding what this audio frequency things mean behind me that I've put on my wall now that navigates all of my, my singer songwriter um, instrumentation is huge for me. So I may not necessarily be creating so much computer music right now, but what the CMC has done for me is giving me that information. So as I go forward and do create these fellowships and working with black women in music and working with youth, and I'm able to have an understanding of these other avenues that they can definitely do. Um, right now in the producer world, in the audio engineering world, only 2% of the industry is made up of black uh, of, of women period and a smaller percentage of black women. So having this experience for me um, really allowed me to understand that there is a, there are other lanes and be able to listen to the other, um, the women that I work with and the youth that I work with um, to be able to create this music. But with the experiment that uh, Brad was hinting to where I used an EEG, that is something that I still would like to further. Um, going into Columbia, I wanted to create scores that literally were soundscapes of people's lives. That was my main reason for going. Um, and that's how I kind of drifted into the neuro neuroscience avenue. Um, Cause a small little fun fact about me is I practically didn't speak for almost 20 years and music was my only vehicle and, and communication with people for a while. 
And so taking that idea of understanding how music really connects to folks, frequency is huge, um, brain activity, all of those things were really important to me. So using an EEG, connecting it with Max and being able to try and see if a love song would actually have that same effect on um, everyone based on their brain activity um, was a very interesting project. And I do hope to continue that, but, um, but the CMC, like I said, gave me, was literally this window into something that I had never thought about before that I had seen as I'm a musician, here's the, the audio engineer. Um, but now having that experience, that is something that I can take with the, the students who are now producers to have a, a, a systematic change on that 2% of the working women in the music industry for producers. So that's where I am. Wow, yeah, I, I told you she was famous. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, Sandra makes a good point though. It's uh, one of the advantages we enjoy as being a part of Columbia University is that we can reach out and engage all these other disciplines like neuroscience and such like that, you know? And to me, that's really exciting because, you know, it makes the center the, the, the nexus of a, of a, of a big, you know, experimentalism. That's, that's just great fun. And it's, it's also interesting to see how this has kind of played itself out with the installation work that, uh, that you all are doing. You know, I call it all music, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's kind of gratifying. Um, let's go on to uh, Katerina because uh, yeah, she's speaking of installations. She's done some pretty remarkable work, but she's also quite a composer too. So Katerina, the question for you, how has this all impacted your life? Thank you very much. Um, you know, we first of all, thank you very much to Sosha and Ellie and everyone that organized this incredible conference. So I'm very happy and to be here and honored as well. Um, reading your question, um, Brad, I, I really start to try to remember, you know, what was the direct influence of, of uh, the CMC to my work? And it has been 20 years that I worked there. And, you know, then images of the CMC came about and for, particularly the sounds like the rattling freight elevator that you take up to, I think, the fifth floor it is. And um, oh, 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 OK. All right. And then, you know, uh, the CMC itself, like many, many rooms, um, um, brown carpet, like the, the, the noise of the ventilation system, storages or classrooms. But sometimes you didn't know what is what just to say, you know, like this creative disorder at times because people were always working there. So the classrooms were available to us to come there with a group of people, collaborations and, and hang out the whole day and try something. And this is very special. And just the first day um, when I was coming to the CMC, I think to meet you, Brad, uh, I was very shy and, you know, in front of this big building and the doorbell downstairs, of course, nobody ever opened. I haven't had my badge, but finally I was in and coming into the CMC and then there was open rooms. And in the first room I, I passed by, there was a very young woman, a student working on the computer and she turned around and greeted me so friendly. And that was Rosalie Hears, who became like one of my really good friends and inspiration for today until today. And I felt, you know, immediately like very welcomed. And so then I was ready to see you Brad and, um, you know, discuss my studies there and very clearly the way uh, Alison, um, Alice Shields, she talked about bodies in space there, you know, how important the movement was, how physical the work was in between all these wheel to wheel tape machines. And of course, they weren't that these machines weren't there when I was studying, but still um, we used really all the rooms and all the space. And so sound and embodiment and space became very big themes for me during that period that I worked there. And maybe I just refer to quickly to two works. Um, they were just simply called room. And basically um, I thought of like an empty space and you would enter with like wire has, wireless headphones and then whole worlds would op open up to you. And you know, I really wanted to explore different performative arenas that would enable the audience to give them the agency to be fully immersed uh, with their bodies into the unfolding of a musical work. Um, and, you know, hence we were working with motion tracking 
and triggering audio files and also um, initiating real-time sound processes while you navigate with your body um, the installation or the space um, seen by cameras, for instance. And I wanted with this format to activate the audience um, to have a more direct and embodied contact uh, with the act of music making and being really immersed in sound and be able to be playful um, with how a, a piece of music can be experienced. And, you know, I, I do come from the, the classical traditional, uh, I mean, contemporary classical music traditions and just thinking of the concert formats that is so rigid and at times a bit elite and you know what to do and what not you can do and uh, dare you if you don't understand very well what's happening on the stage and I with these pieces I just wanted to break the barrier in between the the audience and uh, the stage and give access to 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 uh, music making and you know to to the sound itself to composition musical structures and offer people that to, to play with these um, sonic, all immersive body element um, with sounds that maybe they're not familiar with or with music that they felt, um, you know, part, not part of it or being felt excluded. So um, because I was up to present this work, not in concert halls, but in galleries or in Geneva, I showed it in a town hall where people just pass by and, you know, tumble into the work and then um, enjoy it and feel part of it. So this was my main motivation, um, being at the CMC and um, start to create this series of room pieces. I have room two and have room five and one is based on more myths um, that actually I developed with Luc uh, Dubois. Um, we premiered it in Switzerland in the mountainside and we spent like together two weeks in the mountains um, installing the piece and it was really fantastic fun. I mean, it was a moment just the eyesights came out, you know, and motion tracking and it was, it was quite an adventure at the time working with that technology. Um, and then room five became finally my, my thesis work um, where I, I worked on the basis of actually contemporary classical music. Um, so just to bring, you know, that, that type of music um, closer to the audience to experience themselves, basically. So that is a bit what my work was all about during that time. Great, thanks. Yeah, wonderful time. Okay, next we're going to turn to somebody who I now know well, um, uh, one of my colleagues now at the CMC, Mia Masaoka, and she can tell you about her intense engagement with technology through her career. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I want to thank I want to thank Brad for moderating this panel, and I also want to thank Eli Hisama and Zasha De Castri for putting this unsung stories together. It was a tremendous amount of work, so thank you so much. Um, and yesterday's panels, I was tremendously moved by the stories of Alice Shields, Phil Smiley, um, Laurie Spiegel, and, and the stories of Vasquez and Tamayo that were so heart moving of these women who worked in the CMC and the struggles they encountered due to society and just to the times. And it was just incredible. So thank you so much. It was has really um, changed my perspective of being an artist at the CMC. And, you know, I think it was really amazing. Um, I'm just going to go by talking a little bit about some of my past. Um, if it's OK, I'm going to just share some screens as more of a memory guide for myself than anything else. Um, I started my introduction to electronic music was actually at San Francisco State and it was also with through magnetic tape and it was before digital technology existed. So it was really many, uh, quite a while ago. And, and like Ella Shields mentioned yesterday, there was a real way of thinking about sound as something that you could hold and touch and of course feel with um, and, and cut and have pieces of it that you could then put together in different ways and and um, also working with the oscillators and these, these very vintage Moog synthesizers that were at San Francisco State. So moving, jumping on to decades later, um, 
you know, I was never a student at CMC, but I, I did was aware of Dort, Dort Bach, <clears throat> excuse me, that was started by Douglas Repetto. And um, it was very much of a DIY kind of um, group of people who are doing lots of amazing, interesting things. And I asked him about a lot of questions I had about different projects I was working on. And one of those projects was making um, hundreds of these tiny LED um, uh, solderings where I, I sewed upon a, to, to make a grid. I wanted to make a soft grid monitor that would have a very um, representation of one pixel to one square inch. So you can see in the middle, there are these three grains of rice and that's the size of, that I was working on. I also got, got quite sick from getting um, for, uh, pneumonia from getting infections in the lung from the, the soldering. So, um, but that was my sense of how open and the culture was and interesting and fascinating all these amazing things that were going on at the CMC and I think I think people spoke yesterday of of a very openness that that the director Brad Garton had and that Douglas had and a sense of really fostering and nurturing creativity and um, so I thought that was really a special you know very interesting and special place to be um, one thing about uh, I'll talk a bit about um, the one thread of my work, and I've worked to develop a personal and kind of an emotional approach to sonific and engagement with sonification of the natural world from plants and different kinds of insects, the human body, and the, um, you know, from the spectrum of technology from hacked radio shack burglar alarms when I, um, to sophisticated medical brain analyzers that I got from hospitals to um, different kinds of technology that's used for saving lives rather than arts, being in someone's art studio. But thinking about this, thinking about art as a material, sound as a materiality, I think is really interesting right now because it's being challenged so much with our lives on, um, you know, with the pandemic and what our, ideas are of materiality and sound and realness and liveness and et cetera. So it's a very interesting time, I, I think, to be working. Um, going on with this idea of taking, taking aspects of the natural world and revealing what possible activity is going on. There's plants, of course, have a, in, a, a response that's very that's very sophisticated and very immediate to their environment based on uh, their evolution of how they've evolved. So I've used this working with plants for quite some time now, and um, here's another another version of um, plant. This was in University of Mainz in Germany, and people would touch the plants and, and there would be a, a response of the memory of the plant's life through a video that was on, on sand on the floor. Um, and I know um, I'm just going to talk quickly about one last project. And this was um, a project with, you see these are little small inserts um, that are meant to be put uh, in the vagina and I've called it um, vaginated chairs. And this piece was kind of like, um, you know, an idea of sonifying the body in a certain way. And the, the, the vagina resembles the fleshy folds of the ear without the cartilage. And it's like the third, like the third eye, the third ear connotes this supernatural ability of intuition and perception. And that this way of thinking about um, these, these were mic tiny microphones that were put into vaginas for a performance that was at MoMA PS1 and at different locations. Here's, um, here's photos of when the chairs were actually um, to a specific frequency. Each one had a specific frequency along a spectrum that was mathematically worked out. And there was a, a amplifier for each chair as well. Um, and um, I, so some of these are just kind of um, ideas and windows into some of the ways that I've approached revealing sound and revealing certain as the objects we have in everyday life, including our bodies, including the plants and insects that exist around us and how, how through technology or through different means we're able to understand 
the external world and thereby ourselves as well. So that's um, that's a bit of in a nutshell, I suppose. <laughs> Did I talk too fast? Is it like, do I have more time or? We'll, we'll have plenty of time, Mia. You, that was pretty amazing. You really condensed your, your life into, well, an impossible condensation. Okay. <laughs> no, thanks for sharing all that. Again, your, your investment uh, engagement with this stuff has been pretty profound. Speaking of profound engagements though, I wanna hear now from Mara Helmuth about uh, her work and, and uh, kind of her times. Mara, it's up to you. Great, thank you. Um... Yeah, and thanks again to the organizers and everything for this wonderful event and everyone. Um, okay, so I came to Columbia in 1987 uh, to do a DMA in composition, and I was there until 93, graduated in 94. I had been at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and had already gotten hooked on the unlimited possibilities of the digital world and went to the 87 International Computer Music Conference, which would happen to be there, and heard Brad's talk on his Elthar, Elthar software, um, which was another thing that got me excited. I think there were about four women max at that conference, and so um, that was kind of how the situation was at that time in computer music. And um, but anyway, and so I went to Columbia. I took Brad's class in computer music, learning CMEX, computer music techniques, and found that CMEX allowed me to create my own music much better than I'd been able to before. Um, there was an instrument called Gravy, this windowing pitch and time shifting instrument, and there was the L elliptical filter, which allowed me to really precisely shape control filtering. And so I created the piece Brad mentioned, Malips, and I think that was one of the first pieces that I really felt like was my music. Um, the mixing process at that time, this was all fixed media, all by ear, um, command line, uh, Unix running processes, and you really had to sharpen your listening because you were uh, modifying little numbers of at 0.7 the amplitude would go from 0.05 to 0.06 or something like this, and so your mixing and your listening became really, really sharp. Uh, of, for timings, texture, timbre, and everything else. So that was really um, an interesting way of working. And I do um, think that a listening-based approach, um, it sounds obvious, but it's not because we're so distracted by so many visual things these days that a listening-based approach is still good for sound. Um, the community there was really great. Okay, the name of the computer was Woof, and it was also um, we called, oh, I'm going over to Woof. It was the studio location. It was the community of people that were there at that time. Um, Doug Scott, Rick Bassett, Jay Hardesty, Kitty Brazelton, Thanasis Rakakis. I think Alice Shields was in that class at the time. And then Paul Betchman and Ro, Ro Reed and Doug Chalmers was in the Latin American studies professor. So there were some students, some non-students, um, some returning composers learning digital stuff. And it was really amazing. Um, we worked very intensely. I mean, processes took a long time to, to run. And so you had plenty of time to listen to other people's sounds while your process was computing. Uh, you heard their pieces. Uh, the sense of community was really good because you knew their pieces almost as well as yours because you heard them shape from the ground up. We were all on the same computer and nobody had a system at home at that time. Uh, most of it was fixed media. Um, we took our concerts well to Philosophy Hall, I think uh, someone I mentioned earlier, and downtown to Merck's Cunningham. And we really had a lot of fun. Um, the development of tools became important. I wanted to um, do granular synthesis, and I figured out a way with my Stoke Rand software um, based on CMEX to make these kind of gestural granular uh, controlled sounds, which I'm still using in different ways today, and I really uh, felt like I got more control over my sound through the development of those kind of tools. Um, I was a TA in computer music and a Next Campus consultant when everybody went to the Next around 1990 or 89, and I, I think I was starting to, as a woman, feel a lot more comfortable doing my art, working with other people, and it was just a very good <clears throat> good environment for that. Um, let's see. 
I think later, you know, I've expanded my work in a lot of ways. I teach at the University of Cincinnati, CCM, for 25 years, and I've done a lot of work with interactive music, etc., internet too, and all that. But I think that the core techniques that I was working on and learning there um, really have stayed with me um, a lot of that over the time. And also the idea of creating a good environment to people work in and interact in. That's one thing I try to do in my studio too, um, is have a great collaborative environment. So that's my story. <laughs> Quite a story, too. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, this is something that, that even dates back to, you know, hearing uh, Prill and Alice and Daria speak yesterday, you know, this idea of really just experimenting with the technology, you know, and partly it's because you had to. That's the only way you could get things to work, you know, and kind of fostering a, uh, an approach that said, well, we're going to like build the tools. We're going to do this stuff. You know, that all became part of the compositional process. And I think that's a, that's a really important thing to be able to do. Um, well, personally, I also want to mention Mara said, you know, she's like one of the only women there. I remember, I can't remember which ICNC, like late eighties, early nineties I'd gone to. And I did kind of a little head count. And I realized that Columbia was responsible for over half of the women at the conference, but you have to bear in mind that was like ten women, <laughs> so <laughs> we had five people there. Um, yeah, it was it was it was a very different sort of time, and I'm glad to see that things are changing dramatically. Okay, we're going to do another go round, and then you know start looking for for questions uh, that we can you know maybe tease a little bit further. And again, if you've got questions from the audience, use your Q and A thing to to throw them up, and we'll try and get to some of them. Um, but this is the part, you know, the, the, the name of the round table was uh, New Histories and Futures. This is the future part, okay? I'm going to go around again and uh, ask uh, these kind of seed questions, you know. Uh, think about this, panelists. How do you see your trajectory with music and technology going forward? And do you imagine that technology will help hinder or enable what you do? And how do you situate yourself in that world? And, uh, you know, what would you like to change about it? You know, what things would you like to do differently? So let's go back and uh, uh, call on Nina again. We'll go through the, through the list. All right. Um, well, I think about these questions a lot, especially as my role um, as a teacher. So at USC right now, I'm developing computer and electronic music courses um, and making a little center there. So I'm thinking a lot about physical space and what that means and what this means when so much of what we can do with these particular uh, with these particular media happen within a little laptop that you can take with you basically everywhere. So what is what is a space? Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about like how do you construct a space that's useful when you don't need to have a big computer in there anymore? Um, and for me, the idea, uh, which I think has been mentioned in in this panel discussion already, as uh, represented by the CMC as a, as a gathering place where people were making um, and witnessing each other's creativity, this is essentially important. A space that promotes collaboration, a space that promotes inquiry, and a space that's friendly. Um, a space that's friendly for people who uh, don't know how to use the equipment that's there, um, and a space that is inviting. Um, so these are things that I'm thinking um, a lot about, both physically and then in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we teach these these tools, these concepts, these ideas, so that they're um, all accessible. Uh, and I think um, this works itself into my practice as well. I think uh, artists always use technology. Um, this isn't a, a new thing. Um, you know, I, I guess with the advent of digital technology, it's moved uh, in that direction. But at some point, you know, the violin was a new technology. The piano is a technology. The pen and paper is a technology. Um, and so we're always working uh, with the past um, and the new and shiny elements of the present and analyzing how we dialogue with these um, items in our everyday life and how do we bring them into an art practice that asks questions about how we interact with them, why we interact with them. And so I don't think that the ethos of this uh, really ever changes. It's just we have to be aware to invite uh, new technology coming in um, and uh, not to be scared about, uh, I guess, aging out of, of tech. Um, so this is something that in my own practice, I'm trying to make sure that 
I stay uh, up to date with, you know, the fresh shiny things that all the cool kids on the block are, are doing and interested in so that I, even if I'm not a primary practitioner um, of these tools, ideas, methods, that I can think about how I might want to dialogue with these um, in my practice. So, yeah, I, so I don't think that's ever going to change. And I think as Brad had mentioned in the very beginning with my work, I don't really want to draw an intersection between genre or media. I just want to make stuff by putting stuff that doesn't necessarily belong together um, in a space and, and watching it interact in dialogue, be that uh, with acoustic instruments, with computers, with a mediator, with visuals, with, with sculpture, whatever it is. Um, and, and I hope that we can all continue to do that um, and create collaborative environments. Yeah, good points. Um, you know, I mean, and, and yeah, for better, or for worse, and some people do say for worse, you know, technology is just a, a big part of our lives. You know, and the pandemic has just done, here we all are in these little windows on the screen now, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah, a big part. Um, so, well, it's yeah. A if I can ahead, follow sorry. up, you know, like with the pandemic, I've been thinking a lot about that and how, what am I teaching the students to, to do right now? Um, and, and particularly students who are not interested in, in what they think is, you know, digital media or uh, media work. Uh, like they have to move into this sphere uh, if they want to share work right now. Um, and a lot of what I'm interested in is spatial audio. And so you know, I'm building this uh, ambisonic studio right now, but uh, you know, I can't teach that on Zoom. Uh, but instead we look at binaural audio and what is it like to create personal environments? And so I think we can always ask the questions of limitations and restrictions and bring those back in. Yeah, yeah. And personally, I've been having great fun, you know, fooling with the uh, Oculus Rift glasses and VR. I'm just a disembodied kind of guy, you know. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it's it's interesting to see how this is really you know changing the way that we interact you know for like I said for better or for worse. Um, so I'm going to toss it over to Sandra now. You know how do you see yourself going forward in this world? Um, well, I have so many thoughts on this, and so hopefully some of these sentences I string together make some sense. Um, so touching first thing to think of is just the pandemic. Like we're talking about. Um, I work in live arts right now at a performing arts theater. Their idea of being able to translate something even virtually, um, which includes every element of what we now call techno technology that has to do with the computer, with sound, with video, with all of those things has been um, um, kind of like a wild ride. Like where does this live performing arts go that had this kind of human connection? Um, and where, how can we create that in technology? And we talk about Zoom burnout, we talk about all those other things. We even talk about, um, you know, computer music and, and having this sound of like, um, uh, what Nina was referring to is that like, violins were new technology, piano was new technology. Now technology has become tech, like what we think that has to be designed through a computer. And the violin was built without a computer, you know? So um, for me, there are two ways that I that that I'm working in to see what where my trajectory is in general. Is like as an artist, um, I've worked in the the acoustic field for so long, but understanding this sort of way that there's this innate frequency that happens with all of us, even in the acoustic realm, um, and trying to recreate that in the digital realm for me is something that I'm going to continue to explore, and that's something that you know the CMC has definitely instilled that inquisitive uh, moment for me. But as someone who, my original idea with uh, going to Columbia was to continue my education, go do a PhD in X, Y, and Z, but immediately after my undergrad, it was like, it could just be me doing X, Y, and Z, but I want to be able to impact an entire um, group of young women like me to be able to see this, um, to be able to be in a comfortable space. So pretty much, you know, what you were talking about, Nina, was just like creating these spaces that are very comfortable and inviting um, around tech, because tech already seems to be a bit intimidating. I worked for Apple for five years, teaching, you know, grandmas how to use their, you know, iPhone or th and things like that. Like, tech is very intimidating. How do we make this inviting? How do we make it something that, 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 that um, is very, very useful uh, in just your everyday life as you use it every day, you don't even realize that you're a professional in what you use in tech. So how does that translate in music? How does that translate in things that you create? 
Um, and for me, living most of my music life outside of academia, that's where my focus is, is targeting, not targeting, but working with people who are outside of academia, removing that I just do this or I haven't done this and I haven't done that. Um, but you just made an entire song using an app on your iPhone. That is incredible. Like that is what, you know, what you're doing. Um, I'm currently working on a partnership with women in tech here in Pittsburgh who work with uh, POC women on STEM. So building programs and so on. So our program works with musicians. Why not put those two together and actually have, you know, they can make the next DAW, they can make the next sound, they can make the next, you know what I mean? For these artists, they're thinking creatively and then they're doing the actual programming and vice versa. So making those sort of connections is, is where my focus is. And I don't think technology can hinder. I think it's, it's to that point that like, yes, technology has become this umbrella of an actual computer, but new, new ways of creating things and doing things are, are technology. So I hope those strings of sentences made sense, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think that the, the future is collaboration. The future is inviting. The future is understanding um, in this tech world and, and bringing people along with you and remembering that some people may be new to the language, uh, breaking down some of the language in, in technology to make sure it's open and accessible to everyone in the creative sphere. So yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, it made total sense, Sandra. Um, yeah, you know, and you're, you're kind of pointing out something implicit in what you're saying, you know, technology is a moving target, you know, talking about, you know, making the next DAW on your iPhone or something. Yeah, I remember back when we had a 300 megabyte, never mind, you don't want to hear the old guy stories, you know, but things have dramatically changed. And that's, you know, that's part of the part of the territory. Um, and I want to turn to Katerina with this question, because she's probably facing something in particular about her future, because uh, she's recently taken a new job. And um, yeah, how how do you see yourself moving forward, Catherine? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good question. Um, you know, maybe we start about uh, right away, what would I like to change about all of this? And uh, you really impressed me with what you said in your introduction that right now at Columbia University, you have parity. And, and you know, and you mentioned also it's hard work. And I remember when I was studying there, there were at least like two or three years, I was the only woman there. And, but since then, really, it has changed in America and also at UCSD. I mean, we were very aware of it and we really made a point. We want to work towards diversity and it doesn't just happen by its own. And what I have experienced uh, during, I mean, I've been always in touch with Europe and all of, have a lot of collaborations there and I have the chance to lecture in various um, music schools and it's really the case Europe I don't I mean I can generalize but in general it's not there yet it's and and um, people are not even aware of it and I mean for me I really really want to work on access I really want to make that higher education uh, competitions um, opportunities to play in festivals is there for everyone and you can't believe how many competitions are, you know, like written and you, when you see the jury and it's just, it's just very uniform, you know, and how embarrassing, but people are not even aware. So we try to call out, we, I, I, we, me and others, we try to write to panels and say, this is not possible. I try to alert people say like, how can you be on a, on a panel where you, there are only men or you, there's just one woman or there's really not diversity happen. Can't you say something? So I'm a little bit outraged. It's really still in dark ages. And so this is um, coming back to Europe. This is really one of my highest priorities. And I'm really happy um, I had the chance to start at the University of Music in Lübeck because it's a place that thinks quite future forward. I feel very comfortable there. I've been welcomed very warmly with my ideas and I get full support. Um, so I, you know, I really hope um, that will change and become more inclusive over the next years. It needs work. Yes, it does. Yeah. And that's actually a really good point. I've, I've kind of adopted the policy where if I see a competition that's just all white male juries, I generally don't send it out to our mailing lists um, because that, yeah. that's just yeah. a crime right now. You know, it's, it's kind of sad. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you're, you're interestingly uh, situated there in Lubeck because, you know, Lubeck has a really interesting international history. You know, that's where the Hanseatic League was. was mm-hmm. uh, you know, so you've got this real connection to the world. So that's yeah, right. go, Katharina. <laughs> um, I will, I promise. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, we've, got so, we've got a number of questions about, you know, how we create these, these, uh, these welcoming spaces. But I want to hear from Mia and Mara both about their kind of you know, projections into the future, and then we'll start visiting some of these questions. We've got a bit of time left, so yeah, we'll be able to, to explore some of them. So, so Mia, how do you see yourself? I'm particularly interested because, you know, we'll be working together. So what are you going to be doing? <laughs> um, well, you know, I've, I've, in the past, I've worked with different kinds of proto um, spatial systems that, um, you know, from de- a few decades ago, softwares that don't exist anymore. And it's, it's an interesting thing to think about because again, it's these, these kinds of spaces that are created and that combined with what is a social space and how we can think of social spaces in relationship to human beings in these, um, these spaces that we create through sound and through sound, uh, for example, this wave synthesis, a wave field synthesis at impact that I'm gonna be working with. And I think Nina as well, um, and it's really, in really fascinating and interesting relationships of, phys- of the physics of sound, and melding that. I'm very interested in melding that with with the social space and how to connect that to com- human beings reacting to each other and responding to each other and somehow communicating with each other. Um, I really been enjoying the work in ter- with. Um, virtual reality, augmented reality that's been coming out of the CMC. And I think that um, I've, um, that that's re- really an interesting way to go in terms of creating, creating these abstract spaces to enter into and that the audience can enter into these spaces in different ways. And I think that there's so much potential there for new ideas to take place. Um, it even reminds me of Paulina Laveris, you know, in about 10 years ago or so in Greece, and she was teaching her class in Second Life, and she was an avatar, and all the students in the class were avatars, and they showed their projects, at their, you know, on Second Life, and it was really, really instructive in terms of different ways of teaching, um, but I want to, um, yeah, you know, I think also about trying how I can archive my work, because a lot of the work that I've done is on hardware that doesn't exist anymore, on software that doesn't exist anymore. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm gonna be on this earth for so many years and what's going to happen to the, the work that I've done is on these technologies that don't exist anymore. And so I think moving forward into the future, I, and because I love emergent technologies, it's something that's really exciting for me, but then part of my brain is thinking, okay, but how is this going to translate? How can this be transliterated into other potential hardware or software when this runs out? Because I've already gone through the process of so many things becoming obsolete and not having the hardware and that software anymore. Um, so that's, that's something to think about too, you know, going forward and how to archive the work of ourselves and the work of others um, within this very fast paced transformative technology that's going on. Um, and in terms of dreams, I would really love to have more scholarship money for the Sound Art program. I think that's really critical to have any kind of, you know, any kind of even something just approaching any equity in a real way for, you know, gender and race, et cetera. It's just, it's just it, without that, I, you know, it's really hard to think of how that can move forward. So, um, yeah, but those are just some thoughts, I guess, off the top of my head on that, on those things. <laughs> no, good thoughts. Um, yeah, well, well I, again, I want to hear from Mara. I forgot to mention, Mara is, a, she's got an interesting perspective. She's been a globalist in a good way. Um, she was vice president for conferences uh, for the uh, International Computer Music Conference for several years. And as president of the ICMA, uh, the Computer Music Association, she she was responsible almost single-handedly for bringing in a lot of places in China into the uh, Computer Music Association. So yeah, I just mentioned that, but um, yeah, Mara, what do you see yourself doing uh, going forward? Well, I've gotten really interesting, and probably this is due to a lot of travels around the world uh, and just recording a lot of sound environments through my travels is um, 
just finding ways to, to put an uh, environmental focus. I've always been interested in environmental sound and I've done things that related to that, but um, trying to do works that cultivate a respect for the natural world, um, natural ecosystems of sound, and I think that, you know, with the climate change and the other crises we have going on now, that it's really necessary to cultivate some kind of respect for all beings, not just human. Um, although, of course, humans as well. And um, so anyway, I would like to put that focus in a lot of my future work. I've got a project going called Sonic Refuges to create sound environments that are sort of based on natural sound. and. Um, well, it should go into the VR world right now. I just have video format stuff, but I'm, I'm thinking about um, trying to put it into a VR environment. Maybe this is something that could sort of learn from uh, people's, in an installation setting, learn people's preferences to various sounds, and maybe this would, um, different people could interact in, in these environments in different kinds of ways. So anyway, this is a project I'm kind of, getting going with and I've, I've collected all these materials so I'll probably be working on that. Um, I think still te technology is really necessary for what I do to have the control over the sound and to transform sound. Of course, um, I think we should always be questioning a not environmentally sound or sustainable practices if we can avoid it um, and be thinking about those kinds of things. Um, I still love the idea of creating new performance contexts and situations and that kind of thing. And um, I share Mia's concern about sustainability of software and, uh, and pieces that you can no longer run. So I'm thinking about, you know, it would be a really good idea to um, document all interactive works. <laughs> and I wish there are some that I had documented, but um, anyway, it's a good idea with these quickly changes technologies. Um, the change in technology can be really frustrating. Um, new operating systems, new issues of software, uh, things that are completely dependent on the internet to run. I get very frustrated with having to log onto the internet for everything I do. Um, and putting up with poor audio quality just for convenience sake in certain softwares. But um, anyway, hopefully these things can be avoided. and. Um, I, I love free software and shareware. I like to do that. And I love collaboration with other fields. So I want to keep doing those kinds of things. Collaboration with computer scientists and all that kind of stuff, which creates new great things. Um, maybe that's enough for now. Well, you, you brought up a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both uh, you and me are talking about, you know, archiving. I mean, there's whole conferences to that now you know yeah, yeah. Uh, it is a it is an issue i just i i personally i just kind of gave up on the idea that you know this this music i do is going to last at all which is you know liberating in one way but kind of sad you know i mean there's some pieces of my own i wish i could run now but oh well such is life and oh my god climate change the environment you know bringing up uh, bringing to mind some of the work uh, that judy klein mentioned yesterday you know interspecies uh, cohabitation and things like that that's again a huge area um, you know, I, I, I had some questions I could follow up with, but, you know, we've got some pretty interesting questions coming from the audience right now. And I want to maybe highlight some of those, and I'll just throw them out to everybody, whoever would like to answer this. Um, one of the ones that's kind of been repeated by several people is um, Elliot Britton writes, you know, on the subject of creating new spaces, what are the most successful ways of making high-tech spaces inclusive and accessible? Um, is there a context for specialist creative spaces? And Lainey Pfefferman kind of follows up, you know, how do you, how do you create a, a friendly and open electronic music community, you know? And then Zasha kind of qualified a little bit, you know, it says, you know, what is friendly and inviting to me is not necessarily the same thing for other people. How can we be more aware of what makes a safer, friendly space for people who are coming from different cultural, and, you know, perspectives? So what do you guys think of that? I mean, how do you create these spaces that we all tout as being so wonderful and, and, and terrific with technology? You know, what, what, uh, what's your strategies or what's your response to these? Jump in, anybody. Well, I think you have to help people with the technology. Um, you have to have assistance or whatever that can and provide that kind of help because there's always new changing things and, and somebody has to be up on it. and. 
and you have to make them feel comfortable getting to know it and you have to draw out the people who are quieter um, and less likely to engage um, in an outgoing way. Those are some thoughts I come up with. One thing I think um, is might would be helpful is to have spaces or community spaces where more people who are just entering things for the first time, even right out of high school, like the Daughters of Harlem, where they like from early age, even like 16 years old, they could, there's some ways where they could become involved. And, um, and so, so, so that they're, they're, and of course, I think that people, you know, um, I get really, you know, I, I think if there's these spaces where people could get involved and they could be, they could be young, they could be new to the technology and other places where there just could be a lot of them and somehow finding your own niche and your own room of, of people that you feel comfortable with and you share a lot of the same interests because people have such different interests and, and that everything is so niche right now, you know, so it's, it's, I don't know, it's really fascinating how the, pos the possibilities of these communities could happen over the internet. One thing that was really very important for me when I was living in San Francisco and um, I was involved in electronic music and there was really nobody, no place to, to do it. There were, everything was in the academies. It was either at UC Berkeley or, and I was outside of the academy at the time. And so I started, well, what if we had our own electronic music festival? So I started this thing called the San Francisco Electronic Music Festival. And I invited like 11 of my friends who were in my community and it's, um, you know, and then we got we got um, an amazing speaker system, and we invited people. We curated it, and we did it once a year, and it's like going on for like you know 10, 20 years now. And actually, it's it's a way of really bringing people in who are at different levels with their engagement with electronic music, and and you know, and also different times when different types of music is for different evenings, etc. So that's another possibility of having more friendly spaces where there's community and people can really come together and share what they're doing and learn things. And it is through developing these kinds of um, festivals. Sandra, I'm gonna ask you this because I know with the scale program, you know, part of what you have to do is to try to create these sorts of uh, opening and welcoming creative spaces. What's, what's your approach to doing that? What, what are you trying, what do you do with the, with the scale system? So I think that, I mean, this is a, a also a, a general, and I get more specific about scale is that when looking at um, creating a space um, let's, let's say specifically to tech that is more inviting. Um, if we want to talk about various cultures, we want to talk about women, um, when it's not a predominantly, you know, white male, uh, it is a predominantly white male uh, industry. Um, I think the first thing for anyone is to be super intentional and super explicit and super transparent about who you are creating these spaces for and your intention behind those. And for for me, for Scale, which is a program that is for specifically Black women in music, um, our approach is to invest in the folks who are least invested in, right? And to be able to um, look at it holistically and not just at that one um, entry of, of commonality, which for us, music or it's tech and music. Um, it's the entire spectrum that, why is it an uncomfortable space for them? Why is it a space where they're not as visible? What, is the, what else does the platform need to get them to succeed or to participate in this, in this area? So that's kind of the approach that we take. And with scale, um, I guess I'm fortunate and unfortunate at the same time to be uh, some, I'm creating this program also for myself. Um, in a way that like I've experienced these things being in the industry from the 1990s on up. Like what was my experience as a black gay woman uh, in the music industry doing pop music, doing these things. Um, and so what was uncomfortable in those spaces of going into studios or going into tech or going into those things. And so I think that if your intention is to create something for someone who is possibly you do not represent, Finding someone to work with you who does represent who you're trying to bring in is very important to have in that planning stage. Um, 
And I think that is something that we don't always do. If, if it is for those, for, for kids, let's bring them in at the planning stage before we even create the program. You know, those are some things to, to, to think about. And I think that I was doing a program with CMU, um, Carnegie Mellon here in Pittsburgh, and, and we were working with tech and we were working with actually, literally working with tech, working with uh, Winchester, oh, what was his name? The third, he actually is a professor, now I forget. But he worked for Google for a while. He was doing a bunch of things with tech and with, um, you know, uh, different sensories that don't work on darker skin and those sorts of things. And we were creating a program for kids and it was all of us adults. And I'm like, why don't we sit and talk to the kids and see what information they have? They have a wealth of knowledge. They experience this every day. How can they inform what we can do? We may be in these seats to be able to do X, Y, and Z, but how can they inform our decision-making? You know, how can they inform like, I've had the opportunity to go through school at this point and go to an Ivy League and do all these things. But so that that already sets another privilege that I that I've had. How do I get the to the root of the information for them to inform what we can create with them? So that's that's my approach right now. Um, it's surprising. Doug Gears actually has a great follow-up question um, for that. Uh, and I'm going to specifically ask Nina and Katerina because they're, they're involved. I, I forgot to mention Nina just recently moved to USC. She had had a job at the uh, University of Texas, Austin. Um, so both of you have been involved in kind of creating new programs. And Doug is saying, you know, and this goes back to what Sandra was saying about, you know, looking at student perspectives, you know, do members of the panel have any suggestions about how educators can foster curricula and social environments that show respect to all students' stylistic and aesthetic points of view. Um, Nina, what do you answer to that? Um, I wanna start by pushing off of something that Sandra said about, you know, ask, and I, and I guess everybody has said this too, that like one of the issues is we have to start younger um, in introducing people to working with tech as a creative tool so that there's fluency established at a younger age. Because and what I encounter the most is that there's two things that we have to demystify. And one is I don't belong here because I don't have the STEM skills necessary to function in this place. And the other thing that we have to demystify is I need this budget to be a gearhead and collect all this stuff to make my art. Um, and I think that these are two places where if we look at like a gender disparity, um, you know, if somebody has a lot of guitar pedals and they've been collecting that their whole life and like wants to show them off and somebody who doesn't have that thinks that they don't belong in a studio culture because they don't have all the, that gear, they can't name that gear, they, you know, you can sit around and like compare like, oh, how much stuff do I have with my friend? Um, and so I think that these are two elements that we have to work really hard to demystify. And part of this is creating introductory courses and introductory spaces that get down to the very basic elements of what it is to create sound in space. So looking at music tech and electronic music kind of from like a physics of sounds perspective um, and giving etudes and tools with very basic consumer tech, for example, a cell phone that everybody has now and asking people to go and do recordings and putting these recordings into an open source software and teaching everybody the same skills from the ground up um, doing feedback exercises microphone basic microphone basic speaker to start to explore like what are these relationships um, and because a lot of the people who ha who think they have a lot of the technical tools and the stuff actually don't really know the basics of how this works. So I think going back and like looking really, you know, at what does one plus one really mean is a great creative foundation um, and that we can start our curriculum there and build upward. That way everybody has the same skill set so that we're not assuming skills um, from the onset of bringing people into a community. Also making it look fun. Making it look fun. Yeah, trying to fake them out, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, I got to follow up for you, Nina, in a minute, but I want to hear from Katerina um, because I know she's had to deal with, you know, uh, how, how, how you can confront, you know, various diversities in student backgrounds. You know, certainly you face this at UC San Diego and you'll be facing it now at Lubbock. I mean, what's your strategy? Well, I, I think it's really to, to nurture a culture of um, open-mindedness and find ways um, of communicate to each other and what one can learn from the other. 
Um, so I think the more people you bring in that represent diversity, the more um, you give a sense of, of a belonging and not like, oh, this is, this is an other and I'm here and others are over there. Um, so I, I really believe in, in um, you know, just create a very open space, open classroom. Um, and it, it starts with the curriculum. It starts, of course, you know, with what kind of examples you bring in. And um, I very much agree also with Mina that, that you, you know, bring in artists that really start from scratch, that start from nothing. And, and the creativity doesn't lie in how, how fancy your tool is. It's really if what, what you can do with what is there at hand and teaching students exactly that skill to be flexible and respond to the environment of what is there already. Um, I think that's, that's a, a major step. And then collaborative, you know, like support each other and support each other the more if people do really different things than what I do. You know, so that, that's what I what I would suggest. Yeah, I, I think those are really terrific ideas, you know, and I'm seeing stuff in the chat that people tend are tending to agree with both of you um, quite a bit. Um, I'm going to kind of follow up on on something that Nina was kind of highlighting and she actually posted in the chat. It says, you know, one of the issues with tech is the exclusivity and the pedestal that we currently place quote, tech upon, you know, that it's inherently special and fancy rather than just, you know, being a potential unifier, you know, when you're talking, Katrina, about, you know, collaborative projects and things like that. So um, I want to ask, you know, I'm going to throw this open to the whole panel, you know, and I'm going to also kind of season it with a comment from Gregory Taylor. He says, I'd like to start from Nina's comment about the violin as a technology. Technology. Nearly all of you have talked about personal exploration of new technology. It seems like this sort of winds up involving the creation of instruments and refinements of technology with a virtuoso or definer in, in mind. You know, what, what do you imagine for broadening the discussion of space, you know, through this technology? I mean, we're talking about this tech as something, you know, um, uh, what's your, what's your approach to thinking about tech as not something necessarily unique or special, or do you even agree with that? Maybe it is unique and special. Again, I'm throwing it open. We'll, we'll, we'll jump right in if you can, because otherwise we, we experience the horror of the zoom silence. So anybody, what do you, what do you say to that? Um, well, I just, if I could also cycle back to something that Katarina had said, about thinking about tools. And I think in a certain sense, a de-emphasis of tools and more an emphasis on what is the art that's being created um, could also be a start to democratizing a, a space where people who might not have access to the tools. Um, and it's not so much about the tools, but it's about the creator, the artist. And that's, that's, a, that's I think, a path forward through some of this where it can be, um, and you know, where there can be some way of opening things up for other people. But sorry, I didn't sp talk specifically about the violin. So <laughs> that's okay. Anybody else want to jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, what do you think about this idea of technology as special or not? There it is. I think, you know, silence. I think in, um, you know, I mean, in this very consumer society we live in, this really post capitalist system of the, the tools are made by these so often made by companies that are selling things for money. And, you know, and that there's this, there's this drive, of course, for new tools and spending more money and that, that there's ways of, um, to encourage young artists that I, I, other people have talked about it too, that it's not so much about the tools that they don't have to spend money to, to do, you know, to buy this or to buy that. And that actually really effective and some of the best artists have made things with really simple technology and, or simple tools, or, you know, just, just they're themselves. And that um, a de-emphasis on, on sophistication and expense of, of tools, I think can, can be a healthy way or, or to sometimes approach this question. Yeah. Mara, what do you think? I mean, because I think of tech as being like kind of a fundamental part of a lot of your, your uh, creative work. That's actually true of almost all yeah, of you, you yeah. know, but uh, yeah, so. Uh, well, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm ambivalent, of course. Um, I love the fancy things that you can do with new tech and like to try to explore that. But if you're teaching people who are um, not, I think Nina's idea and Mia's about starting with basics, I think is really great because you can do amazing things with recording a sound in Audacity, you know, and it's, um, it's very accessible. And that's where I start with, um, many students. I, I tend to, in teaching, just provide a lot of diverse approaches and they can take the direction of their projects however they want. And, and some people go for one thing and some people go for another thing. And I think then they can develop their own creative um, pathways. And you can't always predict what person is going to like whatever technique or technology either. So. Um, I think it's just like making it available maybe is, is better than just saying, oh, you must learn this. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's a, that's an excellent point because you can't predict, you know, long ago I gave up on, on, uh, re on the notion that, you know, when we do our graduate admissions that I would know who would be involved in the computer music center because I was invariably completely wrong. <laughs> and, uh, anyhow, we won't go much further into that. A uh, couple of things, and we're going to have to wind up pretty soon here, I'm afraid. Um, it's a, a couple of people have asked about, you know, courses being accessed out of the CMC. We do have some, if you go to our courses pages on the main CMC website, um, like I know that I've made Zoom recordings of all of the seminars that I've done for the last year through COVID. And that's actually been kind of a boon, a technological boon, you know, to be able to do things like that. And there's also a lot of uh, discussion completely, you know, kind of a separate track about this idea of um, archiving work that Mia had raised, you know, and how do we kind of, you know, keep this stuff alive. And uh, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Like I said, I kind of gave up personally. Um, I, do any of the panelists, do you have any clues about what you'd like to do to kind of keep your, your work alive? And then we'll, we'll probably kind of have to wind it up after that. Um, anybody want to I jump in on this? Yeah, I could uh, respond to that. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing is um, uh, about all this technology that, that, that um, goes to the past and we, we, you know, we can't use it anymore. And the question is really, what was the idea of the artwork? I mean, what was the artwork really about and how could this idea live in other formats or other other forms of technology. I mean, this is not a, a, the the truth in the world, but I think to really um, understand what an artist wanted and tried to say with what is the soul of the artwork, and and I that that is something fascinating that I read reading through like museums um, that were very involved uh, with archiving time-based media. So I, I read, I got for a while quite involved to, to read about it. And I was, I found it really fascinating that besides the tool, what is really the meaning or the message of the artwork, basically, you know, to get to the bottom of that. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, I, like I said, I don't have any good good answers. Anybody else want to throw anything in here before we kind of wind it up? Well, yeah. I, I want to, um, Katarina, I think that's like really beautiful what you said. And I think that maybe some of the work we make uh, is not site specific, but time specific um, and lives uh, in its media for a while and then becomes an ephemera uh, and a memory. There's some kind of archive to this. I mean, we can even look at uh, recorded music versus live performance as some version of this, you know, is the album a separate project? It, I think it inherently is. A recording is a different artwork than the same pieces performed live um, and the direction in which that works. And I think, you know, uh, there's some pieces that maybe should just disappear uh, along with the tech, tech fading out or maybe be repurposed into some other work in the future. That's a really good point. I mean, you know, it's only recently that this has become even an issue. I mean, how many, how many times did people hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, you know, back when it was first performed, you know, I mean, anyhow, uh, but of course the archive there was the, uh, the written notation because we can still hear Beethoven's Ninth. But um, anyhow, yeah, we're going to wind it up. I'm going to do kind of a quick lightning round of all of you. And I just want to, you know, just ask you, you know, given all this stuff, you know, are there 
30 seconds each, you know, are there any lessons that you've learned that you want to pass on for the future? Remember, this is being recorded so we can go back and consult it. And I'm just going to go through uh, what I see on here. So Katerina, I'll start with you. Oh, I have the honor. <laughs> I, I just say, you know, like never give up, always try. And if you are in, in a roadblock or anything, just just, you know, step back a while and think anew how you can circumvent uh, struggles and just, you know, communicate to others and together we are always stronger than alone and just go forward. Mara, what do you say? I actually want to just propose that we try to find more ways to document the stories of people who work in this area. Um, this has been a wonderful symposium and it's still a wonderful <laughs> symposium that's going on after this. Um, we're talking with Judy. We would love to have um, interviews with people recorded and stored somehow um, to share these stories and not lose this wonderful history. So um, I just hope that can happen somehow. Yeah, I do want to mention the Heyman Center will be putting all these uh, recorded sessions online in a couple of weeks. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Uh, but now we'll go to Sandra. What words, pearls of wisdom have you got for us? Oh, man. Uh, yes, I, I want to second. Um, do not give up. Um, your, your, your art, your craft information, your exploration of tech is, is valid. Um, I also want to throw in there that it, uh, also an idea of way to preserve um, some of this tech is possibly teach in the reverse, teach present to past. To, to, to see what still remains and how we create music now and bring it back to wherever that started. Um, I think it's a cool way to preserve it and a cool way to keep people engaged and a cool way to, to, to make spaces more comfortable because everybody can start what they know today. All right, Nina and then Mia. Uh, I, I guess to be an, uh, an eternal student um, and just keep keep learning um, and, and know that you know, yeah, be humble and, and search and inquire. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's amazing. And I would say also, um, I know it's been said before, but to get out of your comfort zone whenever you're getting a little too comfortable and think of strategies of ways of getting out of your comfort zone and don't let um, people put you in a category or a box that you don't think fits or that doesn't really speak to what you're doing and also be suspicious and be careful when everybody is being put into some kind of a category or genre or you know kind of a rigid box because it's it's not necessarily um, the most creative kind of action to be taking um, yeah <laughs> Cool. Okay. I'm going to wind up just by saying one thing, you know, since this is, you know, has been about technology, even though we've discussed ways of kind of eliding that, you know, into the world. Um, and just this, this notion, you know, a lot of people talk about our field as being driven by technology. I'm not sure that's, I mean, certainly there's a lot of truth to that, but I see technology, you know, in our field as doing something a little bit different than, you know, uh, it, it, to me, technology, opens doors that were locked or, or creates new doors, you know, out, out into new areas. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that we need to really kind of attend to, you know, because technology is going to continue to develop, you know, what's going to be possible, you know, I wouldn't be here myself were it not for the doors that were unlocked through technology. And, you know, things like, you know, when I became director of the center within two years, we had increased our student involvement by an order of magnitude at the center. And that's, that was enabled by the technology, you know? So I'd like to, you know, not so much focus on the technology, but what, what make, what it makes possible and what we can do with it. Anyhow. So that's my kind of parting words. Um, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to take a short break about 15 minutes. Actually we're on time. Yay panel. You guys did great. <laughs> Um, we got a, we, it, it, the next panel is going to be fighting systemic barriers in electronic music, which is a great follow on for this, I think. Um, Mickey Kaneda is going to be the uh, moderator and we've got a stellar kind of crew as always with these uh, symposium events. Hannah Bosma, Kathy Cox, Francis Morgan, Daniel, Daniel Schromit, um, Asha Tamarisa, you know, it's, it's still going to be a lot of fun. And we got some others uh, later this afternoon. So um, yeah, uh, Zasha DeCastri wanted me to mention that the uh, there's you can see the current CNC work by our 
uh, composers and our sound artists by going to the Unsung Voices website and there's a, a current CMC work tab. Um, please visit it because the work is amazing. You know, this is what, what makes me happy in life is, you know, being able to wake up and see the fabulous stuff that people are doing at the center. So anyhow, thank you all panel. This was terrific. I really enjoyed seeing everybody again and um, I hope I see you in real life soon sometime. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.